Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Let's remember those that are not here today, that God will minister to them, bring healing to their body, their mind, their soul, their spirit. Let's pray for our children that are back in class, those that are teaching. Let's pray for those that have to work today and are not able to be here. And let's pray for this service that God will have his way. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your long-suffering. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would minister in this house. Lord, that you would let your word and your spirit prevail, God, that there would be no hindrance, God, that there would be no isms or schisms, but God, that the unity of the brethren would be in this place. God, that you would move in a mighty way. Let our worship be pleasing and acceptable unto you, God. Open our mind and our spirit. Give us an ear to hear what the spirit says to the church. Help us, God, not to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. And we praise you, God, for the privilege and the honor of being able to speak your name and declare your glory. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. In Jesus' name.
my mind. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to worship Him. Hallelujah. There was no question in my heart this morning when I woke up. I was coming to the house of the Lord. And I was going to praise His name. I've already determined it doesn't matter what the songs are. It doesn't matter what the music sounds like. It doesn't matter who's here, who's not here. It doesn't matter who worships, who doesn't. Now, in these days, when you would see a scroll 
because they didn't really have books back then, but they would see a scroll and it would be folded together. Uh, and when it was written within and on the back, that meant that it was complete. Nothing could be added to it. Nothing could be uh, inserted. It was a complete document. And what we are seeing here, the book or the scroll, is the last will and testament of God. This is the Lord saying, here it is. Here's my will, my testament. These are the things that are going to happen. We see later in the last chapter of Revelation where he said, he that taketh the words out of this book or he that addeth to the book, uh, he's going to have some punishments, some curses, some things to him. So this book is complete. We're not supposed to be adding to it or taking away from it. But the book is a complete book. Whenever you saw something that had writing within and on the back, it meant that it was complete. You could not add to it. He said that it was sealed with seven seals. So there's a couple different meanings to this and things that we need to look at. A Roman will or a, a will and testament that was written under Roman law would have uh, seven seals, anywhere from five to seven seals put on it, that were only to be opened by the appointed heir. So if, if you were in Roman time and you would uh, leave a will for your family, only the appointed heir could remove the seals of that document. The seals are not specifically part of the book or the scroll, but rather they're like a key. Think of a diary that you would lock and you would uh, have the key and you couldn't get into the diary without the lock. That's kind of like what these seals were. Many times they would use hot wax and someone would dip their signet ring in it and then they would seal yeah. that will and testament with their ring. And when it was delivered and the seals were not broken, then you knew that the will and testament had not been altered or tampered with. And so you knew it was a pure and complete document, and you could trust its authority because the seal had not been broken. So John said, I saw the last will and testament of, of God, and it was sealed with seven seals. And so it was a complete document. It was secure. Church, we can trust that the word of God is secure. Jesus said, my word is forever settled in heaven. It's not up for debate. We don't get to edit the word of God. We don't get to add to it or delete the things that we don't like. But we've got to leave the word of God as it is. You and I do not have the authority. The Pope does not have the authority. No man on the face of this earth has the authority to change one jot or tittle, the Bible says. We have got to leave the word of God as it is. There will be legal action taken against us in judgment if we alter the word of God. Verse 2, he said, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? Who is the heir? Who can open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or in earth, verse 3, neither under the earth was able to open the book or to look thereon. And now John is speaking again in verse 4, and he said, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Church, we need to thank God for people that can teach the word of God to us. We need to thank God for people that can minister the word of the Lord and preach the word of God to us. God, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. For the way Lawhorn wrote a song, Preacher, preach to me. Mike Bowling in the Southern Gospel community wrote a song, Preacher, or thank God for the preacher. We need to thank God for people that will open the book yeah. and declare what thus saith the Lord Amen. to us. The word of God gives us hope. The will of God is found in the word of God. And we need to thank God for those who open the book and read it and declare it to us. But this is talking about the book that John saw in heaven. And he said there was nobody that was worthy to open the book. And John wept because he could not find somebody. There was no one in heaven that could open the book. But one of the elders, remember the elders, there were 24 of them. And, and one of the typologies is that it represented the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles representing the Old Testament and the New Testament. The completion of God's covenant. The 24 elders, this will come into play in some later chapters, also represents the 24 priesthoods of the Old Testament. So we'll talk about that in a few chapters later, but just keep that tucked in. But it also means the old and the new, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, 
it makes God's covenant complete. But one of the elders said unto me, said unto John, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. He said, there might not be anybody worthy among men, but there's the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's the root of David, and he has prevailed, and he is going to open the book. So the elders said, Jesus will be opening the book. Jesus will be opening the book. The will of God and this seal. Thank God that Jesus came robed in flesh and the word of God was made flesh and he revealed God's will to us. He said, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now he's, he's seeing the type of, the, of Christ, the type of the Messiah, the lamb of God. He's not seeing literally a lamb. He's using literary figures that tie into scripture. And he's saying, I saw the lamb of God standing in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the elders, and in the midst of the beast. And he said it was a lamb that had been slain. Jesus was the lamb that had been slain, and he was worthy to open the seals. He said he had seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, when he said he had seven horns, horns represented power. They represented authority. You would fill your horn with oil. You would fill your horn with the anointing. When Samuel went to anoint Saul and David king, he filled his horn with oil, and that was his authority to act on the behalf of God. He would go out and he would anoint that king. And so when he saw the seven horns, that represented the complete power and authority of God. So the lamb who had been slain now had the seven horns. He had complete power and authority. When Jesus came, the Bible said he came and was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. When Jesus came, he came as a servant. The Bible said even though he considered, considered himself to be equal with God, he took upon himself the form of a servant. As the Lamb of God, he came and he allowed himself to be beaten. He allowed himself to be crucified. Jesus told the Pharisees and the soldiers, he said, No man takes my life, but I lay it down. He allowed it to happen. Scripture tells us that he could have called the 10,000 angels and they would have come and taken him off the cross. But the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, allowed himself to be a sacrifice, allowed himself to be a servant for our sake. And that is the picture that we are seeing here. We are seeing the Lamb of God that had been slain, the blood and the wounds that were upon him. I believe when we see Jesus Christ, we will yeah. see the wounds that were yeah. laid upon him. We will see the stripes upon his back. We will see the pain that he suffered for us. Yeah. The Lamb of God is one that had been slain. But he had now the seven horns the full power of God, and the seven spirits of God. We talked about that last week in Isaiah chapter 11. The Bible talks about how the spirit of God would rest upon Jesus, rest upon the Messiah, and it was the spirit of counsel, the spirit of wisdom, and, and, and many, many other things, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And it wasn't seven different spirits. It was one spirit, and it was talking about the attributes of that spirit, the attributes of the ways that that spirit Moved. And so it's not seven different spirits, it's one spirit. He said that uh, in verse 7, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now we've got to talk about this for a minute because some people, if you're not understanding, you might think that this is a picture of the Trinity. This is not a Trinitarian scripture. This is not John seeing a, a picture of a divine trinity. The Bible tells us from Genesis to Revelation that God is one. God is not divided. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. He told Philip in John chapter 14, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus is the Father, robed in flesh. And so this is not a picture of the Trinity. But what we are seeing here is that Jesus was the lamb for sinners slain, but he's also the one who sits on the throne. And what made him worthy to open the scroll was the work of Calvary. And so what John is seeing is that the sacrifice of Calvary made him worthy to open the scroll. 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, we don't read this scripture very often. We like 37, 38, and 39. We like Acts 2, 1 through 4. But in Acts 2, 36, Peter said that, he, that this same Jesus who had been crucified hath been made both Lord and Christ. Now, we kind of skip over that a little bit. But he said, this same Jesus hath been made both Lord and Christ. Those are two opposite roles. You see, Lord was master. Lord was ruler. Lord was authority. Christ was the anointed one, the sacrifice, the lamb, the Messiah. Both Lord and Christ. He was ruler and servant. He was priest and offering. And that's what we're seeing in this picture here. Jesus is both the one that sits on the throne, but his work of Calvary is ever before him. That's why when the Bible says that he is in, inter he is in heaven making intercession for us, it's not that Jesus, the Son of God, is bowed down to the Father on the throne, but it's that the work of Calvary is ever before him. The blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, it is ever before him in heaven ever. As a memorial. The work of Calvary is never ending. And so we see Jesus here. His work on the throne made, or his work on the cross made him worthy to open the seals. We see that in Philippians chapter 2 when it says that he was given a name above every name because he made himself obedient to the death on the cross. It was that death on the cross that elevated the name of Jesus. That's why before the death on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was no baptism in Jesus' name. That name had not been elevated yet. The name was set apart. It was given by the angel in Matthew chapter 1 when he said, And he shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sin. But the power of the name of Jesus, it was elevated in his obedience. You see, the man Christ Jesus could have avoided the cross. But it was his obedience in the garden that said, not my will, but thy will be done. It was his obedience when he went to the cross and he opened not his mouth. It was his obedience that elevated his name. And so this name, this obedience, this sacrifice is what made him worthy to be both the one sitting on the throne and the lamb opening the scroll. So now we see in verse 7 that he's opening He's taking the book or the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And in verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So what we see here, and we'll talk about this just for a minute, when we see the four and twenty elders, this is also a picture. Remember I said that the twenty-four elders can represent the priesthood of the Old Testament, the twenty-four offices of the priest. When you see the twenty-four elders bowing down to the Lamb, that is the Old Testament giving way to the New Testament. That is the Old Testament saying, our work is done. The covenant of the Old is done. and We are acquiescing or we are surrendering to the New Testament. The Old Testament bows down to the Lamb because the Lamb fulfilled. He didn't destroy it. Yeah. He fulfilled it. Yeah. And so when the 24 elders bow down before the Lamb, he is, they are bowing down, and that is the Old Testament giving way to the New Testament. You can't have two wills. You can't. One negates the other. And so the Old Testament bows down and gives way to that better covenant, that better Sacrifice that better will for us. And so that's what we're seeing here. Now he talked about the prayers of the saints. Psalm 141 verse 2 tells us that the prayers of the saints are the, the, the odors of heaven, the, 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 the incense of heaven. And so when he talks about the prayers of the saints being bottled up, these are every prayer that Daniel prayed, every prayer that Abraham prayed. This is every prayer that every Old Testament saint had ever prayed, prayed that prayer that Elijah prayed in 1 Kings 18 when he said, Hear me, O God, let these people know that I am your servant, and let the fire fall, and let their hearts be turned. That prayer that brought fire down from heaven, it was sealed up in these vials that the saints 
we're protecting. Church, every prayer that we have ever prayed is alive and well in yes. the realm of heaven. Yeah. It is protected. Prayers never die. I was praying the other day for Bishop Halsey. Most of you don't even know him, but he helped to start the church that my wife uh, was born and raised in. That Sister Cerise got the Holy Ghost in. And I began to think about Bishop Halsey. He would tell us how if, if he could bottle up the tears that he had cried from the town of Albion that he could mop the church basement with his tears. And I thought about the tears that he prayed. I thought about how his children, I don't believe any of them, are serving God today. And I began to weep and I, I just began to pray for Brother Halsey's children. And I, I don't even know some of them. I haven't even met some of them. But I began to think about this scripture where the, the, the prayers are bottled up before God and they're an incense before him. And I said, God, I know his prayers are still alive. And God, even though Brother Halsey's been gone for over 20 years or almost 30, God touches children. God God, save his children. And I began to weep for those individuals that God would save their souls. And what I want to say to you is, church, there might be prayers that you have prayed 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you might not see the answer to them yet. But your prayers are ever before the throne. That's and right. You take your last breath. If right. that prayer has not been answered, that prayer is ever before the throne of God. And right. God will see to it that that prayer Come on. is Amen. answered. Verse 9, it says that they sung a new song. So they bowed down to the Lamb, and they sung a new song. This is the New Testament. This is the song of redemption. They could not sing this song before they surrendered to the Lamb. The Old Testament song is a different song than the New Testament. And they bowed down, and they sang a new song. It's just like in 2 Corinthians 5.17 when it said, If any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. It's the same word. A new song. Yeah. It didn't exist before. A new quality. He said they sang a new song. Saying, thou art worthy to take the book. To open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain. And hath redeemed us to God by the blood. Out of every kindred. And tongue and people and nation. Thank God that his blood redeems every kindred, every tongue, every nation. It doesn't matter if you're from Africa, Australia, England, Russia, China, United States, Germany, France. It doesn't matter where you're from. The blood will save people from every nation, every kindred, every tongue. Nation talks about government. Right now our world is in a mess. The whole world is watching the United States. But you know what? It doesn't matter because out of every government, out of every nation, there will be people that are saved. God will move. Amen. God will have his way. Church, somebody asked me if I was discouraged about how things were going. I said, no, I'm not because Jesus never changed. Right. 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 His authority is not in question today. That's right. And he is the one that blesses me. He is the one that prospers me. He is the one that provides for me. Right. He's the one that protects me when I'm driving down the road. He's the one that speaks to me and puts bread on my table. I'm not discouraged because Jesus is still on the throne. Hallelujah. But out of every nation, out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, there will be the redeemed. When we get to heaven, it won't just be all Americans there. It won't just be all Jewish people there. There's going to be black and white and red and yellow. There's going to be Indian tribes. There's going to be tribes we've never heard of. There are going to be people there that were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Right. Verse 10. And has made us unto our God both kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is talking about the thousand-year millennial reign. After the rapture, when Jesus comes back to step down on the earth and rule from Jerusalem, the Bible says that we will reign with him for a thousand years. And so that's what he's speaking of here, that we will reign. The redeemed of the Lord will reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. Verse 11. And I beheld... And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Now, in the Greek numerical system, ten thousand is the largest number used. 
So when he said, I beheld the number of them, and it was 10,000 by 10,000, he wasn't trying to give us an exact mathematical equation, but what he was saying was it was the mass. I couldn't even count it. It was innumerable. It's kind of like when you do that equation on your calculator, and it, it you know, puts all the decimals in there, and it goes clear out, and then it says E, and you can't, you can't add to it. You can't do another calculation. The calculator said, you computed all that we can compute. That's what John is saying here. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands times thousands. He's saying the voices that I heard were innumerable. I could not even begin to count them. That's how many angels are around the throne. He said the angels. And the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, church people ask, well, you know, if, when Satan fell, people uh, believe that he took a third of the angels with him. So how many are still in heaven? Innumerable. Innumerable. They can't even be counted. Thank God for angels. The Bible says in Psalms that the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. The <clears throat> last week we talked about the fear of the Lord. Why do I fear God? Because I want angels surrounding me. I want the protection of God. I want the favor of God. I want God's blessing on my life. I thank God that when I call his name, he's able to send angels right. to stop yes. the car right. accident. He's able to send angels to the hospital room. When we can't get in there to pray for you, God's able to send angels to minister for us. Many people misread that scripture in Hebrews where it said, are they not all ministering spirits which are sent to minister? And most people read to us. But the scripture says to minister for us. Mm -hmm. You know what that means? When we can't get there, the angels can. Right. And God is able to send angels to minister on our behalf. And I have prayed that prayer many times. God, I can't get there. They won't let me in the hospital. We can't go to the prison. But God, there are people that need you. Lord, send your angels to minister to them. Lord, send your angels to minister to them. We see it in the Old Testament. Angels ministered to Jacob. Angels ministered to Abraham. Angels grabbed a hold of Lot and drug him out of the city. Uh -huh. God has used angels throughout history to minister to mankind. And I personally don't believe he's done. Right. If he's done, why would the writer of Hebrews mention that angels are ministering spirits sent to minister for us? So I believe that we can ask God to send angels. Now, I don't believe in praying to angels. But I believe we can say, God, send your angels. Send your angels to minister. Send your angels to encamp around about their bed. Sister Connie, you had angels encamped around about your bed. I sent them there. I asked God to send angels to minister to you. Those that when things would go on and were not able to be there, I asked God, Lord, fill the operating room. Lord, send angels to minister to them. Thank God for angels that are able to minister where we can't. Verse 12. What were they saying? What were these thousands saying? They were saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such that are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. What does the Bible say in Philippians chapter 2 verse 10? That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven. What did John say? And every creature which is in heaven and of things in the earth. This is Paul writing in Philippians chapter 2. This is John writing in Revelation 5.13. And they give the same picture. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth. And then Paul said, under the earth. Or in the earth. And then John said, under the earth. And things that are <clears throat> in the earth and under the earth. That every tongue should confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. It lines up with Matthew 5, 13. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea. I heard them all say, blessing and honor. 
glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne forever and ever. Church, what are we supposed to be singing? Glory and honor and power be to God. What is the song of the redeemed? Worthy is the lamb for sinners slain. Worthy is the lamb that was able to take the will of God and open it up to us. Worthy is the lamb that was sacrificed for our sins, that took our place, that purchased our way into heaven. Church, thank God that we have a new song. Thank God that we can declare his name and his glory. We've got to be careful that we don't declare the will of the enemy. We've got to be careful that we don't walk around talking about doom and gloom and destruction. But if we're going to declare anybody's will, I want to declare the will of God. I want to declare the righteousness of God. If I'm going to sing a song, it's not going to be, woe is me, everybody hates me, I'm just going to go eat worms. But I'm going to sing the song of the redeemed. I'm in the earth. And so when the name of Jesus is mentioned, I'm going to bow and I'm going to cry out his holiness and I'm going to declare him. He's not just Lord of the White House when Donald Trump's there. He's still Lord of the White House no matter who's in the White House. Amen. He's Lord no matter what. Thank God. He wasn't elected to his position. And no man can take it from him, the Bible says. I'm thankful. Church, I'm going to declare his name. I'm going to declare his glory. We have a choice what we sing. We have a choice what we speak. We have a choice what we say. But I am going to carry the name of Jesus. If we've been baptized in Jesus' name, we carry his name with us everywhere we go. You know what that means? The only thing we should be speaking is victory, righteousness, holy, love. We should not be speaking defeat. We should not be speaking division. We should be ministers of healing, ministers of reconciliation. At the name of Jesus, every knee should right. bow. Church, the only thing we need to be confessing is that Jesus is in control. I trust him. I lean on him. I hope in him. My salvation is in him. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's going to work it out. Amen. That's the testimony of the saints. That's the testimony of the redeemed. Does that mean that it's always going to be easy? No. But in the middle of my trial, you know what song I'm going to sing? Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get me behind. Victory today is mine. My whole world might be falling apart, but I carry the name of Jesus, and I'm going to declare his victory because God is greater than any trial, any problem, any trouble, any situation. He's bigger than any sickness. He's bigger than any sentence of judgment. He's bigger than any addiction, any sin that has us bound. God is bigger, and I am going to declare his glory, and I am going to honor him. Every creature, every creature, church, if, if the creatures can declare his glory, then what about the redeemed? Right. If all of creation can declare his glory, then why can't we? Yeah. They do it because they have no choice. We have a choice. We need to declare the glory of God. Verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The four beasts, again, we talked about that last week. They represent every picture of Christ that was given in the New Testament, but they also represent God's covenant to every creation on the earth. The beast, the fowl, the man, the bird of the air. God has a covenant that is established. And in verse 14, we see unity. Everything in heaven, old and new together. There was no argument. Well, we're of the Old Testament. We're of the New Testament. We're of the New Testament. No, they all came together. And they all said amen. And they all worshiped. Chapters 4 and 5 give us a picture of that, the worship happening in heaven. The church it was unity. There was not one creature in heaven that wasn't worshiping. There was not one angel 
not one voice that was raised from in worship and in music. And that's what we need to be in church. No wonder in Psalm, I believe it's 133, David wrote, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He said, it is like the anointing, the oil that ran down over the beard of Aaron, even unto his garments. And he said, there God commands the blessing. Church, when we can come together and we can worship, and we are all in one mind and one accord. It will release the power of God. Yeah. What happened on the day of Pentecost? They were all in one mind and one accord. Yeah, right. You know why I believe the scripture records that? Because they were human beings and it didn't always happen. But they were in one mind and one accord. Yeah. The disciples had disagreements. In Acts chapter 15, we see that there were disagreements, and they had to have the first general conference of the New Testament church. They had to come together, because some disciples were teaching one thing, some disciples were teaching another, and it was causing confusion in the church, and they had to come together. Differences of opinion and problems with unity and people getting along and agreeing on doctrine, that's not a new issue. That's happened from the beginning. But in Acts chapter 2, I think we see a picture of if we can come together in one mind and one accord. If we can lay aside our differences that aren't contradictory to the word of God. Some things we can't budge on. But there are other things that we need to say, you know what, that might just be personal preference. That might just be tradition. That might just be, you know, things that, that we've always done, but it's not really... You know, if you don't do it, you're not disobeying the Bible. I'm not talking about agreeing to the point of disobeying the Bible. We got to stand on the word. If we err from the Bible, then God is not on our side. Right. But church, I'm talking about these petty differences that divide us. Yeah. I believe the writer included that because it didn't always happen. Mind you, these are the same people that we just read in the Gospels where they, I mean, just 50 days before. Peter was jealous of John's relationship with Jesus. And when Jesus said to Peter, you're going to be crucified, you're going to die a martyr, Peter looked at John and said, what about him? These are the same people that for three and a half years, they said, oh Lord, we want to sit on your right, and we want to sit on your left, and who's the closest to you, and we want to do this, and we want to... They didn't change in 50 days. They didn't even have the Holy Ghost yet, so no, they did not change. These were the same people that you got them in a room together for 10 days, and on the 10th day, they were still in one mind and one accord, or they just got there, one or the other. Could you imagine being locked in this church with everybody here for 10 days? There might be some dead bodies being drug out by the end of the 10th day. But after 10 days of being in an upper room, after 10 days of praying, maybe that's what we need is 10 days of praying, and then we'll all be in one mind and one accord. Maybe the greatest miracle of Pentecost was not the, the infilling of the Spirit, but that he had 120 people, they were all in agreement. That might be the greatest miracle. But he said, there, God commands the blessing, even life. Forevermore. The Spirit of God is the life of God in us. Church, what would happen if we could come in in one mind and one accord and everybody was worshiping? That doesn't mean everybody's running the aisles, everybody's dancing, but what if everybody was worshiping? Some were crying, some were singing, some were clapping. You know what I miss? I miss clapping. Yeah. I miss when people would clap with the songs. Yeah. I miss that. What if everybody lifted their voice? What if we had a choir of 60 people singing in the congregation? If everybody came together and we were worshiping. That's a picture of heaven. That's when the spirit falls. That's when souls are going to be saved. That's when bodies are going to be healed. When we come together in unity. And it doesn't just happen. You've got to work for it. You've got to put 
push for it. You've got to fight for it. That's why the Bible says, as much as lies within you, follow peace with all men. And sometimes it's exhausting, but you know what? We just got to make up our mind. I'm coming in here, and I already know I'm going to praise. I already know I'm going to worship. It doesn't matter. I know I've shared this story before, but I'm going to close with this. There was a, an older saint of God that they were getting ready to start the Sunday night service and she's sitting in the back of the church and the new convert comes in, kind of a hippie. She has her baby on her hip and she walks in and she's greeting the, the elder saint and she said, Sister, are you going to shout tonight? And the older saint looked up at the new convert and said, Well, I don't know yet. It just depends on if the spirit moves. And the new convert looked at her and said, well, here, hold my baby, because I know I'm going to show <laughs> She came in. She knew. She wasn't worried about the song. She wasn't worried about anybody else. She said, hold my baby, because right. I know I'm going to shout. Right. What if we came in with that attitude? I know I'm going to worship. They might miss every note on the praise team. They might be a sweet little baby. They might be as fat as my tire was yesterday. They might be sitting on the floor. They might not even have their shoes on. They might be as fat as my tire was yesterday. They might sound like an elephant that's constipated. But I'm going to worship. Come on. Mm -hmm. right. I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship you. Amen. What if we came in with that mindset, church? And we came in with unity. That's when we're going to see a picture of heaven. Jesus taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. If we want it to be on earth as it is in heaven, then everybody has to be in one mind and one accord. And we have got to worship him. We've got to be in unity. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the picture of this heavenly worship. God, help us, Lord, that we will come together in one mind and one of you. That we will come together and worship you. Not because everything is exactly the way we want it or need it to be. Not because we're in perfect agreement with everybody. Unity is not perfect agreement. Unity is loving above our disagreement. God, help us to come together in unity and worship you on earth as it is in heaven. God, fill this place with your glory. Let it be like it was in the upper room. Let us be in one mind and one accord. And then the Spirit of God would sweep through this place and we would see souls filled with the Holy Ghost. God, let it be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed for a quick break. We'll be back at noon for worship service. God bless you in Jesus' name.